Hey, thank you for joining us back. Um, we go on with the uh, next speaker before uh, the lunch break. And then uh, after lunch, we have the student uh, presentations. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, uh, who already gave a presentation here, Dr. Jason Bartos. He's an uh, interventional cardiologist and uh, also critical care cardiologist. And he will uh, tell us something about when you are uh, heading to an emergency, what, how, what are you going to do to keep the quality alive and, uh, and make sure the patient gets uh, the care that uh, they need. So thank you, Dr. Bartos. Thank you, everybody. Um, this, all of you are experts in emergencies, and I've heard a lot. And this is a great, uh, this is a great talk from Justine talking about uh, that specific emergency, but you all deal with emergencies all the time. The question is how to be best prepared and how to deal with emergencies in the, in the situation. All of you probably have pointers and things that will would be additive to this talk, so feel free to, to provide those additions um, at the end, but I will hopefully give you a good overview here of some general concepts and some approaches for how to, uh, again, maintain quality in the setting of an emergency. Same disclosures as before, federal funding and stuff for mostly the ECPR work. Okay, so the first theme of emergency management and quality in emergencies is to maintain uh, and create and maintain expertise. And how do you do that? So if you think about code blue teams in the hospital, it turns out not every hospital has a code blue team. Uh, maybe some of you work at hospitals that don't, about three quarters do, but um, some don't. But the idea is you have a team that uh, specializes to some extent, although there are many residents and trainees on those teams oftentimes, but at the very foundation and core of that team is a group of people who really do this every day. Uh, for um, a lot of our facilities, we have a code every day, every other day, uh, maybe just a, a couple a week. But either way, those same groups of people are, are um, going to those. And so you get expertise from uh, going to these multiple incidents and you maintain it over time. Turns out volume is important for a ton of procedures, pretty much every procedure. This is a list of the procedures where data has determined that volume matters. Upper left, of course, cabbage. So this is um, pertinent to many of you. Um, but it's a whole litany of different procedures. Essentially, everything we do in a hospital benefits from having volume. So if you are a low volume operator, you likely do not have as much uh, experience and expertise in certain emergencies um, and in the other mishaps that can, that can happen in the setting of these different procedures. And that's a concern. So how do you supplement that? And we're going to talk about uh, some of those means to um, provide for those cases where you don't have enough volume to maintain expertise. But basically, again, everything. Now, I, of course, come from my world of ECPR. Um, and so I'll have a lot of analogies to that. But one of the other ways you maintain expertise um, or create it is to limit the number of people who do things. So if you have 10 surgeons or 10 interventional cardiologists and you do five procedures a month, that means that you're only doing one every other month. That is not maintaining a skill set. And so when you have a relatively low volume procedure, you maintain the expertise by having a very limited number of people that do that procedure. For us, it's four people doing all of our UCPR cannulations still today. Uh, we started off with just two of us together doing all of them for two years, 24 seven call. And it's me and Dimitri Yiannopoulos were the two folks who got suckered into that deal. So the, again, a restricted group of people doing uh, the few procedures you have to try to create that expertise, maintain it, and then you can bring in other folks. When you look at ECMO in general, uh, something near and dear to my heart, and I know many of you, uh, there is a volume quality relationship, at least in terms of outcomes. So if you look at the upper right, in hospital mortality for uh, centers based on their ECMO volume uh, cases per year on the x-axis, that decrease in mortality starts to happen around 40 cases a year. This is all ECMOs. This is not just ECPR or just VV ECMO. This is all comers. But as you go over time, it, or as you increase the number of cases, that mortality comes down. If you look at the bottom left, this is one year mortality. So this is a little bit stricter. 
Um, but you have various categories and there really isn't a basement. There isn't a point at which you have enough experience and any more will not add. As far as has been studied, although low numbers are a curse of many of these studies, uh, there really hasn't been a maximum number of cases at which point there's no point in adding more. In this case, 40 again was sort of the number at which they said that was their highest uh, volume group. And as they dropped down the volumes, they had increasing mortality at one year as they went. So again, ECMO, definitely volume dependent. ECPR, similarly volume dependent, although the numbers are even sadly smaller. A high volume ECMO or ECPR center is 12 cases per year. That's one per month. That's not what I would call high volume for any other procedure on the planet, but this is what the world of ECPR considers um, to be high volume because there are just so few centers doing it in few uh, cases at those centers. For us, we do about 120 a year. I don't know um, where in between us and the rest uh, the mortalities end up, but still at that high volume of 12 per year, you end up with a mortality benefit over uh, less than that. So still, even at those low numbers, there's a benefit of doing 12 versus 10 versus six. Um, it still matters. So if you don't have, again, if you don't have the volume, then practice becomes critical. And the question is, how do you generate practice? How do you generate practice that it results in improvement in outcomes? So yes, obviously more is better. We would all love to spend all of our free time uh, practicing the procedures that we take part in, but most of us can't. So again, there are certain characteristics of good practice that uh, enhance team uh, efficacy. And really the best thing you can do, if at all possible, and this is asking a lot, is high frequency, short duration practice. Now in the setting, this has been studied a lot in the setting of CPR. Obviously, it's a very different procedure than what you do every day and what I do every day. But in that setting, monthly is better than every three months, which is better than every six months, which is better than every 12 months. So again, there is no point at which that frequency is the max quality you can get. One month was 12 times better than yearly CPR practice. And the practice in this case was about two to six minutes in duration basically one to three cycles of CPR with feedback, uh, which they, these folks just walked up with a mannequin that was there sort of automated. They could do their CPR, they get their feedback, they do another round. If they didn't meet the quality criteria, they'd go back for a third time if they didn't meet that. And it maxed out at three. So this is basically six months or six minutes every week um, or every, sorry, every month, uh, gave them that 12 fold increase in quality. And that is way more than you get with any other variation in the people who are doing the CPR. So again, this is CPR. It's a much simpler procedure. Uh, it's uh, a very different thing to simulate. But if you can apply this to your procedures and think about maybe I don't need to run through the whole process from beginning to end. Maybe I can truncate it to a 15 or a 30 minute uh, emergent uh, procedure, at least for that component of it, and come back and do that frequently. The things you really care about um, the handing off of lines, the uh, swapping out an oxygenator, the um, recannulation, those sorts of things that perhaps can be done in a, a briefer, more truncated procedure, um, you probably get better outcomes from that. So next principle of all things um, emergency management is predetermining your roles. This pit crew model, which you hear a lot about these days, at least again in the world of resuscitation. And of course, none of us have this many people around our table happily. It'd probably be messy in our rooms if we had that many people. But the idea is that the people you do have, you define their roles, you limit the folks who don't have a role. So you don't have the bystanders and looky-loos, but you have the people who are really there to do a job and can do it. You may have a backup person for them. Again, in the setting of CPR, you always have a second CPR person around. But you have, everybody there has a job and everybody knows their job. And importantly, people don't roam and I don't mean roam from job to job, but actually from space to space, they are literally tied to their location. Now in the OR, that may be a little more regimented already. But if you think about codes, it very much isn't. Code teams show up and it's a slew of humanity that just sort of roams around a room in a cloud and a mass, and it's a problem. And so if you can limit that geography and get the, the people at certain places are the CPR people or the auctioneer people or whatever roles you have in your emergencies, 
then uh, you can go a long way to simplifying the process, knowing where to look, um, and getting the job done. So the uh, Salt Lake City Fire Department uh, implemented this program for pit crew CPR in the field. So again, similar to the cloud of humanity I was talking about for Code Blues, they, in the field, there's nothing but open space, right? They may be in a closed, in a bathroom in somebody's fifth story apartment. That's a different story, even worse story. But if you're in, the, in somebody's driveway, you could presumably be anywhere. But they took that pit crew idea and they applied it to that population. And they, uh, they had a couple other implementing, uh, or a couple other processes they implemented at the same time. So it's not purely just the pit crew idea, but um, that was part of this process. And they looked at their outcomes before and after. And that's this data. So when they looked at the patient outcomes, they, so let's just say off the bat, we all hopefully agree that bystander CPR is a good thing. The bystander CPR improves outcomes. That's been shown over and over and over again in studies. That said, this pit crew model, or at least the implementation of these multiple things, including the pit crew model, improved outcomes in these patients to the same degree as bystander CPR changed the outcomes in these patients. Which means if you can implement a process like this, you can actually have a very measurable impact. People were 2.3 times more likely to survive neurologically intact if you did the pit crew model or if you compare the patient's pre and post pit crew implementation in Salt Lake City. This is back in 2016. This isn't new news. Uh, but it's dramatic impact. It's more than I would have anticipated from a change like that. This is what we do for our Code Blue team at the University of Minnesota for in-hospital cardiac arrests. And this actually, again, you get a bunch of physicians in the room, they're pretty sure they know what, they're, what the best thing to do is. And often it is not a regimented, geographically confined, role confined thing because they wanna be able to, to do whatever's on their mind in the moment. This, it was a big change for them to have a defined role in a defined place. And it's, of course, they're non-physicians of this team as well they were easier, to, is an easier sell for them. But we basically said, this is a patient in a bed. This is a patient on the floor. This is a patient in the lobby. These are the places that these different roles exist. We define the roles, define the, the people who would be playing those roles. We kicked everybody else out into the hallway. You'll see the longest list is that in the hallway list on the right. Those people don't come in the room. They do not have a role in that room, but they may if they're asked to come in. So if we need an EKG, that EKG person will be asked to come in, do their EKG, and then go back in the hallway. Same with all these people, to preserve the space and the simplicity. So I know if I'm the code leader at the foot of the bed, I know where to look to uh, find the um, intern or whoever the, the, um, the family support person is, et cetera. I can just look to that geographic zone and say, that's my person. We also have little roll stickers that we put on but uh, you have that geographic link as well. At the same time, everybody has the freedom in their space to do what they need to do without the crowding that comes from a, a lot of people. We did something similar in the cath lab for our eCPR program that I talked about the last time. Um, and this was somewhat based, by the or, uh, based on the organic uh, location people existed in anyway. So this was not a change for anybody. It was more of a description. But once we had it and we could put it down, it sort of made sense and people stuck with it. The smallest box, by the way, well, the cath tech has the smallest box, but the second smallest box is the physician. Again, we stay in the small space. But the nurses get to roam, um, get to go all over the place. Respiratory therapist and perfusion has uh, similarly larger spaces. But the idea is that they go there, we don't get in their way, we let them have their space, and then we also localize supplies to those areas that these different groups would need. So if we need the ECMO card and the, the supplies for that, that goes next to perfusion. Respiratory therapy has the vent and airway supplies. Uh, nurses have all their meds and, and tubing and things they need for that. So we have all of this geographically laid out. Again, simpler than Code Blues because we just had fewer people. Gets a little trickier when we go to emergency departments and we have our team um, for the mobile ECMO cannulations in emergency departments. And then we have the whole ED team as well. So this is another description of that. Um, and here you'll notice the, again, the supplies and localization of equipment. So we have the C arm that lives in that spot. Um, every time we have our ECMO machine, sterile table, supply cart that are located in those areas. And the benefit of a map like this is then when our team is coming, the ED can prep the room and have these things in the right spot. 
Uh, then we have all the staff from the ED that are sort of strewn about across the, the space where they normally live, the recorder, um, the, the MD and, and others. And then we have our team uh, in, living in our space. And we tried very intentionally to create sort of a sterile area and a non-sterile area. Uh, but in the end, everybody sort of inherently sticks to these. And it, I mean, it was built based on where people thought they should be. So it made sense. But uh, once it's on paper, people tend to stick with it. The next thing is supplies. And again, I said we localize the supplies to these areas. The other thing to keep in mind is the kits. So for us, we know what our procedure is going to be by and large, which is a little bit of an advantage over somebody who's doing a procedure and then an emergency happens. I respect that's a different scenario. Although I would argue that many of those emergencies can still be predicted as a possibility and prepared for as a possibility. And you can have kits associated with those different emergencies. So if you think about the emergencies you run into, um, I bet you can figure out little supply kits that you would need for each of those individual things. And this is one of our kits. One of the principles of our kits, because everything's trying, we're trying to get set up and going and we're trying to get somebody on pump within three to six minutes, we really want to open everything in as quickly as possible. We're, doing, we're opening sterile equipment and plopping it on the, the sterile table. And so we built our kits to be all or nothing, meaning when we come in, everything in kit one gets opened. Even if we're not gonna need that thing necessarily, we likely will, and we don't put anything extra in the kit. So our folks will take the entire kit, open everything in it on the table. I don't need to be asking for specific things or supervising with their opening. They just open everything. If I need something in addition, it's on the cart. They can grab it, they can open it. But this is the fundamental stuff that 75, 80% of people, I can get on pump with nothing but this. And that's kit one. Kit two, so then I get them on pump, we can all take a breath, and then we open kit two. That's the next part for hemodynamic monitoring, for um, distal perfusion, for those other aspects. But kit one is just get us on pump, get us to the hemodynamic stabilization. The other thing is um, the type and timing of the equipment. So if you, again, kit one, kit two, that's based on the timing. If you're looking at a supply cart, which is these carts, uh, then you want to put your things together by type. So you have your wires in one spot, your, your um, other sort of uh, cannulas and things in, in similar locations so people know where to reach for things. But if it's in the same spot, it's, it's uh, grouped by type, then people can sort of aim for that and find it much easier for those few extra things that we do need. Uh, but ideally, again, everything's in the, the kit that we have pre-built. Of course, we have everything labeled and we have extras of things. If you have the need for something, it will be dropped at some point during the, the process, especially if it needs to be sterile. And so we always have the extra so that we can pull it and, and add that to the table should somebody um, have a bad day. The other thing I will say is, back to the, sort of the geography of the situation, that's true of the people, but it's also true of the supplies. So if you look at this picture on the right, this is a picture of us once we've opened everything. So there are feet there in the upper sort of right side of that picture. That's where we're standing. That's where the proceduralists are standing. The, the supplies that are closest to us, actually the top half of the, that supply sort of chain there is all the stuff we're actually going to use. The bottom half is extra stuff that comes in the kits that we don't really want. If we could custom build every kit, we could pull a fair amount of things out of that kit. There are also a few things that come in the kit that we may use occasionally, but they're not as consistent. But having the supplies you're actually going to use closer to you is a big deal. And so we lay this out. And again, the people who are opening everything know kit one stuff goes in, in that top half. The bottom half is extra stuff from our, our cath lab kit um, that includes, again, a lot of things that would be normal cath lab supplies that we don't generally need. Um, and then, and again, this minimizes, this not only gives us access and proximity to the things we need, it also minimizes the distractions of things we don't need. If you're searching through the pile of stuff to get the one thing you need, then you're wasting time. So uh, it helps uh, minimize those wasted efforts as well. Okay, so to processes. So the simpler, the better. A lot of the things you do every day are pretty complex uh, and it's hard to simplify those, but certainly for the public, there are some classic examples. Uh, things for CPR in particular, where you've the no-no-go process here. So if a, a dispatcher is talking to a person calling in about their loved one who is on the ground. They will ask them if they're conscious. 
If the person says no, they'll ask them if they're breathing normally, and if they say no, then they say start compressions. That's it. It's a really a three-step process. Simpl also, the CPR process itself simplified down to chest compression only. That wasn't because breaths aren't helpful. It was because perhaps chest compression only will make it easier for people to do CPR, make them feel like they don't need to do the breaths, which are a little bit awkward and, and a sort of preventing some people from wanting to jump into doing CPR. So there's that effort, but also it makes it much simpler. All you need to learn as a bystander in modern society is to do chest compressions, which again can be done in two to six minutes on a mannequin uh, once a month. All you need to uh, think about in the moment of emergency when your stress hormones are high is push it on someone's chest. And all the dispatcher needs to teach you to do on the phone is push on somebody's chest. It simplifies everything. So again, this is simpler than 99.9% .9 of the things you do. But to the extent that you can strip out for the emergencies, strip out some of those uh, extra uh, little steps, the better. And one of the ways we do that is with checklists. Now checklists are great in the moment because they help you, but also helps you plan out ahead of time. So there is that added benefit of making checklists. There's a bit of a rule to try to avoid anything more than about seven steps in a checklist. Now, I don't know about you, but most things I do require more than seven steps. However, they don't require seven steps written down. Most of the things I do, the things that I'm going to forget, the things that I need to, that are really the linchpins of the procedure, I can still probably boil down to seven steps. But if you look at the checklist, these are two checklists from our system, from our eCPR team. The bottom left is a checklist for what we do emergently. That's, it's short, it's concise, it hits most of the, the high points and the things that are the big worries. The worries for us is that we show up in an ED where there's a pre-stationed ECMO, uh, ECMO circuit and machine, and it sat there for a few days and there might be some air in the circuit. That's a big worry for us, that if we come in and we just connect the circuit right away, there might be air uh, pumped into that patient. So one of the things you'll see uh, that fourth point is actually kind of a belabored point on spinning things up to make sure that air is gone. That's one that we've said, we're just gonna bite the bullet on a few extra words on our checklist just to make sure that that does not happen. But the other things are pretty basic fundamentals and they're quick. The checklist on the right is the thing we can do during the breathing time for us. The patient's stable, hemodynamics are set, they're doing okay. Now we can take this long, arduous, painful checklist and say, we're going to dedicate ourselves to making sure we don't miss steps that could cause problems in the future, but the patient is already stable now. And so I think the universal rule of seven, where you're trying to avoid more than seven steps is very important and useful for the emergent things where you're trying to keep things simple, hit the high points and make sure that you're eliminating the big dangers and the things that are often forgotten. But when it comes to the, again, sort of the, um, check back, make sure you've done the things you need to do, and prevention of future problems, you can have a bit of a longer, more painful checklist that uh, we all, you know, uh, is more indicative of the procedures that we do. Again, these are customized to the process um, and to the circumstances, emergent versus not. Okay, then optimizing communication. So we all talk a lot in emergencies. The hope is that all of the talking is useful, all of the talking is concise, and all the talking is directed to only the people who need to hear it for that emergency. However, even in that talking, there are some things we do that um, can be improved. And I think we all can improve things. There are some things here that you've probably heard over and over for years, like closed loop communication. We all uh, hear the, the need for that and it makes a lot of sense and it works great. But there are other things that I think are more common. This mitigating language, people who are probably being polite saying, could someone please do this? Could you please do this? Those are extra words that nobody needs in those circumstances. So again, trying to streamline our language and say, please, we could still be polite, but we still say, please do this, please do that. Demonstrating and discussing our point, but um, not using the extra words. Defining our lexicon. So I don't know, the OR is a, a culture all its own. And so you guys undoubtedly have your own language between you and the surgeons, between you and each other, between you and the scrub techs, between you and the nurses, et cetera. Um, that said, there's some common themes that people can use and almost gets a little, for those of us who've done EMS things, you start to feel like you're, you're talking on a radio uh, out in the field, but things like saying copy or confirm, or I say that, I say again, or things like that, where there are certain words that trigger a person's attention and response to uh, what you're going to say. So if you haven't 
uh, already developed those things uh, or think about, you know, you probably have others that you use in the OR uh, that I'm not even familiar with. But um, those critical words that in your community make sense to you and trigger the response you need. And the last thing is graded assertiveness. So that's not to say that you're not being assertive the entire time or being thoughtful and, and conveying your point. It's to say that you are making a key that the other person can in instantly understand. There is no interpretation needed. They know, you're basically saying, I am level one concerned, I am level two concerned, I am on fire level three concerned. And the, the recommendation of many is that those terms instead of level one, two, and three are I'm concerned, I'm uncomfortable, and this is a safety issue. And I don't know if any of you uh, use those terms routinely in the OR, uh, but uh, we certainly do in the cath lab and we do in the ICU and, and in many other places. So um, I, I would recommend that you think about that. And as a team, if you're using those terms then people, again, they don't have to know or they don't have to wonder what you're saying. They know that if you're saying you're uncomfortable about something, that this is a real issue that we need to deal with now. It's not an issue that may be getting worse and, and your sort of early warning uh, about this, this issue. This is a real issue right now. Other individual characteristics. So we as people bring to our situation our own personalities, our own characteristics, our own stress uh, uh, scenario of that day. Maybe things are stressful in life otherwise, and now we're adding the stress of our job to that. We also respond differently to stress, but there's a sort of fundamental balance of the things you have, the tools you have at that point to deal with issues and your perception of the sort of demands of that time. So when the demands exceed the resources, the human body tends to go into a fight or flight response. It sees that as a threat. We all have those responses to different things. If there was a bear in this room right now, I would definitely have that scenario. We perceive that as a threat. The problem is that when we perceive things as a threat, we don't think as clearly. The epinephrine in our own bodies, not what we're giving the patient, but our own, uh, changes our ability to pay attention to things and respond to things. That's compared to when we feel like we have resources in excess of what we need, in which case we may feel challenged by the circumstance, but we can focus on it, we can think through it, and we can work through it. So the key to this is to note that this is still a perception. You may still have not enough resources to do what you need at that moment, but as long as you feel like you do, you can still work through the problem and think through it. So a lot of the ways we deal with this, and many of you probably do many of these things, is to change our perception. It's not to change, I mean, it's wonderful if you can change your resources, but if you can't, then changing uh, how you perceive those resources actually helps. So the way the people uh, recommend doing this, controlling your breathing, focusing on your breathing, a little bit of meditation in that moment, just through breathing, uh, can be helpful to reduce that stress response. Talking to yourself in soothing, comforting ways. Not sure if you uh, have tried that in the OR, but I'd be curious what your experience with that has been. Stress inoculation training. This is basically what I tell my fellows I'm doing with them every day. Uh, making their life really hard today so that tomorrow seems easy. That's what this is. Um, really making them or making yourself in your training feel like you're the stressed you're ever, most stressed you're ever going to be in that moment. Mental rehearsal, imaging or imagining. Uh, the event, walking through it step by step, that actually is a great way to increase the volume of cases, so to speak, just by practicing in your own head. And there is good data that that actually helps uh, performance. So, you know, walking through those steps of a procedure, what you would do actually um, is a, another way of, again, experiencing it. And then overlearning, meaning you drive yourself, you do so much extra. You don't stop when you feel you have sufficient training. You keep going to train yourself even more so that it's so comfortable that then when there's a tweak to it or an adverse aspect to it, then it's easy, you, you have plenty of resources for that demand because now your resources aren't spent at all or very little on the actual procedure itself. Debriefing, which was touched on wonderfully, uh, is a critical part to this. Now there are two parts, there are two kinds of debriefs. Uh, there's the cold debrief and the hot debrief. The hot debrief, is in the moment. It's right after the circumstance. And there is some debate about whether hot debriefing is good in all circumstances and, and when it should be used. The issues of hot debriefing are really the emotions that are still running high at that time. It lends itself 
to a little bit more of a combative interaction within the team as you discuss a circumstance. That's not ideal. The, the hope is to use debriefing to identify issues just like Justine did greatly in, in her presentation, to identify those issues and to work out how to deal with them and, and prevent them in the future. If you, in that hot debriefing, it can be a challenge. So cold debriefing is generally what people talk about, reassembling after the fact, maybe days, maybe weeks after, and going through the details of the process and, and uh, trying to identify ways to improve. The issue with that is that memory is fragile. That you, you bring, if people are just relying on their memories of what happened, that can be very, very hard to have a reliable discussion. So if you have objective data, if you have tools that will record that objective data for you, then that's even more helpful. You can bring that objective data to jog memories and also to correct memories uh, during the, that uh, cold debrief later. And then the other side effect of debriefing that is a very good side effect is that it can help with the emotional aspects of emergencies. And what we don't give each other enough credit for, I think, in the world of medicine, and what is being appreciated more and more in the EMS communities is that these emergencies take a toll on us. They take a toll on the people dealing with the emergency. We all have our own little graveyard where we remember certain patients that didn't make it through the emergencies that we deal with. And that graveyard fills up and takes a toll. And so the more debriefing we do as a group, as a team, and ideally in that supportive environment, the more we can work through some of those things and hopefully prevent burnout and, and the things that can come uh, with that excessive stress. So again, not something that is often talked about with these uh, debriefing aspects when we think about quality assurance and improvement, but certainly a benefit to our teams. And the principles of all this is that plan do check and act. So we're, we have our process, we're doing that process, we reassess the quality of that process and the things that could go better, and then we change things and act. And uh, again, we can do that for ourselves and we can also do that for our processes in our systems. Okay, so in summary, so we've, in terms of maintaining that expertise and that quality um, in emergencies, we first wanna create and maintain expertise. You are all experts in what you do. Uh, you will hopefully have plenty of volume in the places where you're working to maintain that expertise. But in terms of emergencies, you probably don't see all of the emergencies as frequently as you would need to be as proficient as you would like to be. And so you need to maintain that another way. And that way can come through practice. It can come through that mental uh, modeling and mental uh, imagery. Um, and it can go come through discussions and, and case discussions uh, so you learn from other people's mistakes as well and other people's processes. You concentrate experience where you can. It's obviously a challenge with emergencies, although that's, again, code blue teams. And you may have uh, backup emergency teams for the OR as well that, that bring that experience to bear uh, with a smaller subset of practitioners uh, that are you know, dealing with those things routinely. You simplify everything, is, uh, everything that you can as much as possible. That comes down to the supplies, the environment, the people, everything about it, the process. You predetermine those team roles and the geography in which they exist uh, so, that they, so you can predict where they're going to be, what they're doing, and who's in those roles. You control your supplies and the environment. You cognitively offload those checklists. Give yourself a chance to check back in, take that breath, figure out uh, if there's anything that you've missed. You uh, have individuals that have uh, a role um, in improving uh, their approach to those emergencies. So you have people trained in the, um, the controlled breathing and the, the mental uh, imagery and those sorts of things. Again, you t give your, your teams a chance to learn those tools and to use those tools. Uh, you uh, enhance your communication strategies as we talked about and, and uh, the stress management piece. And then there's that debriefing and again, focusing on, in part, at least, focusing on the team and the team dynamics and the team healing uh, after these emergencies is increasingly important. And I'm happy to talk or hear your experiences, answer questions, uh, and talk further about any of this. Thank you so much.